Welcome, this is Adobe Lightroom Classic. And yes, you heard that correctly, it is Classic. Now Classic is not an old version of Lightroom. It's the version optimized for using on a laptop or a tower computer. CC, Adobe Lightroom CC, is optimized to use on a tablet or a phone. So there is a big difference between the two programs. This series will be focused on classic. This is what I use in my college beginning photography classroom and what we're gonna be looking at here. Now Lightroom is an interesting program because it's sort of a hybrid of a whole bunch of different things. It's a browser, it's a photo editor, it's a raw converter, it can make books, slideshows, and even make a web page. So it's got a whole bunch of different features in it. The main things that we're gonna be focused in on this series are gonna be the library and the develop module of the program. I'm gonna be teaching you how to use it in the same manner that I teach in my college classes. So the steps that I show you are the exact same steps that I use in college to teach somebody how to use this program. Let's go ahead and take a look and see what we've got up here. This is our main screen that we see. And you'll notice that We've got a big picture here in the center. We've got some thumbnails down here on the bottom right hand corner. Over here is where most of the adjustments are gonna be made. We are in the library module and the library module is our browser, meaning it's the looker at her. So if I click on a different image, it's gonna preview it there. Now I can change that preview by clicking on these buttons and I'll explain these other buttons later, but for right now, we're just gonna go ahead and keep it on this single image. Up here on the top, we have the library, we have the develop where you're gonna be adjusting the image. We have a map, a area to make books, a slideshow, a print, a web, and then some cloud services. But we're gonna stick on the library module for right now. Now, if this is the first time you've opened it, yours might look a little bit different. Don't worry about that. We're gonna talk about that in the preferences. All right, so let's get started. We are going to take a look at how to use Adobe Lightroom Classic. All right, so the first thing we're gonna take a look at in this program is something that no one ever wants to take a look at. And if you don't wanna take a look at it, skip through this part and go to the next section. We're gonna take a look at the preferences and people are gonna be like, why are you opening up the preferences? I just wanna learn how to use the program. Well, there's a lot of stuff in the preferences that are helpful if you set them correctly. So we're gonna quickly go through that. I'll do it as fast as possible because I know it's not fun. So we're gonna go up here to preferences and I'll scroll this over here to the center. This is as large as I can make this. We're gonna click on the first one, which is general. All right, so the first thing is my language is in English and you can switch that to whatever you want. Now, the interesting thing about this is a lot of these are default. However, a lot of them are just personal preference. Like, does it matter if you see the splash screen when this starts up? Not really. So if you don't wanna see it, uncheck it. Another aspect is I'm gonna go through some of these and not hit on a lot. I know some people are gonna wanna know every single thing about every little thing that's in here. We're gonna spend time on the ones that I think that are important, and we're gonna brush over those ones that I think are not important. Look, this video is not for me to tell you how to do it, it's to show you what it is, and then you need to make a decision on your workflow or what you like as to what you set. So show import dialog when a memory card is detected, meaning when you put a card in, do you want it to pop up? If you don't want it to pop up, that's fine. Otherwise, there's a little import button over here. You can just click on import and you'll be fine. Select the current slash previous import collection during import. Yeah, so when you're importing, you want it to select the one that you're importing. Ignore the camera generated folder names when naming folders. And I have that unchecked because I'm gonna show you how to name folders and that's what we're gonna actually use. Now this one here is very subjective. Treat JPEG files next to the raw files as separate photos. So what does that mean? Well, on a camera, you can actually shoot or take an image in both raw and JPEG at the same time. 
Lightroom has the ability to do something called stacking. And so you would see it down here where it would have one image right over top of the second image, meaning the raw photo and the JPEG. You're seeing them right on top of each other. Or would you prefer to have the raw here, the JPEG here? If you wanna see both of them, then you would click that box. Replace embedded previews with standard previews during idle time. Now on this one, I have it checked, but we're gonna actually tell Lightroom to build the standard previews and that's gonna kind of override it. This would speed the process up if you just use the embedded preview that came from the camera. Down here, we have sounds. Notice I have no sounds. As you import, when it's done, do you wanna hear a sound? That's, that's what that stuff is. If you do, click on it, pick a sound, voila, you'll have a sound. Presets. You will see what these presets mean in a little bit, but there are some options. We have Adobe Default, which I use. You can use your camera settings, or you can use one of the presets that are built into the program. I don't like presets, meaning that you can apply these as you import. That doesn't make any sense to me. You will see, and I will explain it when we do the import process. Override global settings for specific cameras. I use the same camera, so I don't have that selected. If you were to click it, it would give the option to pick what you want. Right here, visibility, show partially compatible, develop presets. This is just a default setting. I don't know what the difference would be if you had it unchecked or not. Store presets within this catalog. So this is just giving you the option. If you have your own presets, where do you want to save them? If you want to restore or reset things, you can come down here and click that stuff. External editing. Now this is one of the more important ones and this did this before. So let me open this back up. So it didn't show that edit in Photoshop. There's some sort of an error when you're clicking on that button. But anyways, you can tell right here, mine says edit in Photoshop. And, and what this is saying, external editing, if I take this image and I make some adjustments in Lightroom, but then I wanna send it in this case to Photoshop, what do I want the computer to do with it? Well, first I want it to convert it to a PSD. Because remember, the develop module is actually a raw conversion program. I don't want to send it to raw again to do the same thing. However, you could do that. I want to use the color space of Adobe 98. We will go into what color spaces mean. Profoto is the largest one. However, I don't find it useful because almost every screen in the world can't display it. P3 is more of a new one that we have. sRGB is what they use for the web. And in my case, I prefer Adobe RGB. You can easily convert to the different profiles. I just want it to apply this one because that's what I'm using when I go into Photoshop. 16 bits over eight bits because you have way more information. That's kind of the whole point of actually shooting raw to get all the extra data. And right here, 300 pixels per inch. That's what I basically work in. Notice this is not dots per inch, it's 300 pixels per inch. Now. If you were to open this up for the first time, it's gonna look more like this, meaning that it wants you to pick one of the ones that are available. Now it's not giving me Photoshop because I've already selected it. This gives you a secondary editor that you could select and do the exact same thing for. File handling. File handling is set up. If anybody has ever opened a raw file, you'll notice it attaches an XMP sidecar file with it and it drives people nuts. I don't know why, it's not a big deal. However, a long time ago, when RAW first started to come around, Adobe created this DNG file, which is Adobe Digital Negative, and they wanted all the camera manufacturers to use their file as a universal file just because it would make things easier. However, the camera makers didn't want to do it, so they still have it. And, and what this allows you to do on import, you can convert from, let's say, a CR2 or an NEF file to a DNG. It's still a raw file. You're just converting it over. One of the cool things about DNG is it, it will embed that XMP file into it. Um, it does compress your image a little bit. You also have the choice to pick the type of preview that you get. And then you have some options down here to embed fast load data just to speed things up. 
or to embed the original raw file. Down here, we have some metadata options. These aren't anything that I use, but if you want to go ahead and read through and what it says that it does, feel free to do it. I don't use it. So this is for file name generation and stuff like that. What you can and what you can't use, what you should use, how to replace things. Interface. This is just how it looks. Look through it, read it. But if you don't like this being dark gray and you want it to be white, you can easily change any of that stuff. That's basically what you're doing. There's some other options down here, but nothing that's so important. Performance is another important one. Lightroom actually does use a graphics processor. So you can see mine's on auto. You have custom in off. Used to have an on and an off, but now it looks like it's got auto. Photoshop doesn't really use, Photoshop doesn't really use the graphics processor as much as Lightroom does. In my case, I have a higher end computer with a graphics processor, so I want it to take advantage of that when it needs it. The next one is cache. And if you don't understand what cache is, it might be worth your while to take some time, but cache stores local information that can be retrieved quickly. So let's say you open up this image and you make some adjustments to it. Lightroom will store all that information in the cache and it makes it easily accessible and quick. Otherwise, when you close out the computer program, when you click on it again, it'd have to read everything all over again. It would, it would take more time if you had like 50 files in here to read everything all over again. If you're using cache, it's already got it in its local memory. It can quickly access it. What's important here is where your cache is. If you have a computer with not a lot of internal storage, you might want to change this location. Right now, mine is on the internal hard drive. Um, I do have two external really fast SSDs, so I could switch that over to those. You can also purge or remove cache. That's never going to hurt your image. It's not going to remove the data or the adjustments that you made to it. It's just removing the cache. It's actually not a bad thing to do every once in a while because usually I work on photos and then I'm done with them and then I'll never access them again. So I don't need that cache sitting in there eating up space. You also have one for video as well. You can control your size of your cache. Right now, mine's at 20 gigabytes. I think that's the default. We have a little develop things and this has to do with um, the preview showing the loop, which I actually hate, but because I teach, I have that. So students know what it is because it's on by default. We have some catalog settings. We will get into cataloging. It's its own beast. And I'll explain to everybody exactly what the catalog is. The next thing that we have is a syncing ability. So basically, if you worked on Lightroom at two different computers and you had a central location to store all of your data, you could sync this up and Lightroom will work. However, Lightroom will not work off a server. Then we have a display thing for right now. We're not going to be using this in network. We're not going to be using that as well. So that's it. I know it was a tough thing to go through, but there are a few things in there that are helpful to click on. Next step here is I'm just going to go ahead and explain what we're seeing here in the window. And I'm going to switch back to library because I want to kind of start at the beginning. Now, the first thing, if your screen does not look exactly like this, it could be because your preferences are set up different. Or you'll see these little triangles that we have right here. So we've got one here, one here, one over here, and one down here. If you click on that, you'll notice it will hide something. And this kind of does a hover and show option. So if I hover over that black, then this little line pops back up. If I go away, it hides it. For tutorials, I always have this stuff up. If you want to get rid of this right bar right here, you would click on this arrow and it would hide. All you have to do is hover over it. It would pop up. Or in this case, we're going to do that. And you can do that with this. This will hide and show your thumbnails. And then this left one will hide and show this column over here on the left hand side of the screen. All right, we will start at the top left here. We have the navigator and I just have some dummy photos right here 
so we can see what it is. But the navigator just basically shows you the image that you're selected on. So if I select this one, it's going to show you that in your navigator window. If the navigator is not open, it's because that little triangle is not open or clicked on. You can just go ahead and click it and it will open. Your catalog is where you're storing your photos. And I will explain that in the next video. We have folders. Think of this is just your hard drive. It's showing you a finder. So we have a hard drive here, hard drive here, hard drive here, hard drive here. And it's showing me the files that I've loaded in here. We have collections. Collections, you can do two different types of collections. You can do a regular collection. Think of it as a folder. And if you have an image, you can put that image in that folder. Let's say you take pictures of your dog. And every time you take pictures of your dog, you have a couple that you like. You can store them in that folder. It does not physically move them to that location. It just remembers the path of where your images are located. However, it keeps all the images in one location so they're easy to find. The smart collection, you use a series of variables to find stuff, meaning if you give an image a star down here, you can say any image that has five stars, put it in this collection. And then if you ever wanna see all the images that you gave five stars, you click on that and it would show you everything, even though they might all reside in lead different folders. Down here, we have some publishing services and there are more options than we see here. I don't actually use this, so I've never actually, so I don't have any of them selected right now. But if you wanted to have kind of a one-click button, you need to set it up in the beginning and then you could click and this would auto send this to Flickr. We will go on up here to the top right. So up here, we have the library. This is known as a browser. Just think of it as a looker adder, meaning we have our images, we import them, whichever one I select, we can look at. We have different ways to view this window. So we have a grid view, a single view is what I use most often and a few other ones. I'll explain the other ones when we have some more images. You'll notice on this photo, it has this little exclamation mark. This actually means that it has the preview in the cache that we talked about, but the file isn't in the location where it's supposed to. So if I tried to work on this, it wouldn't actually let me work on it. And we'll do a whole video just on this. So I'll show you how to find them and then select it so that it can find all the images. But this is just saying, hey, I have no idea where the main file actually is. The next is the develop module. And nothing's gonna be highlighted here because the file could not be found, just like I was saying before. And over here, these are all the different adjustments that we have available to manipulate or change the way an image looks. We'll go over that stuff. We have maps. I've never actually used maps, but if you have GPS data on your camera, it would apply it in the metadata and you could point to the locations of where your images are. I guess if you wanted to click on Spain and look at all the images that you took in Spain, it would work. We also here have some metadata so you could apply that information in there and then you could put it on the board. I don't have that much time in my life to spend doing that type of stuff. We can make a book. However, you'll notice this is a blurb photo book. And if we click on this, it's blurb, 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 and then just basic PDF and JPEG. I've never used this. This is really just a proprietary kind of like link that goes to blurb. I don't actually know what blurb is. However, I do make books and most book companies have their own proprietary software. So this is not helpful to me. We can make a slideshow. So if you want to make a slideshow, there's some basic options over here to apply and make a slideshow. It works. It's not that great. This is our print window. If we want to print anything and over here we have web and this probably hasn't been updated hardly at all since they started the program. This is a really, really, really old style, basic HTML web page. This isn't something you ever want to actually probably use, but it does have the option. If you want to go ahead and do it down here is cloud syncing and we'll get into that later. I'm going to go ahead and click back on the library just to get back to the main menu. Down here are our thumbnails. If you want to make your thumbnails larger or smaller, you can just simply go between these two spots on that line. So notice I have 
a pointer and then I get that different symbol, I left click and hold and I drag up and down, it will just make your thumbnails bigger or smaller. I don't look at my actual thumbnail image at all. I'm looking at the image up here. So I have mine pretty small. We do have a way to filter images and we will talk about that when we go into culling. Well, hopefully you're enjoying this video so far. I just like to take a moment to say the YouTube algorithm really likes it when you watch the whole video, you like the video and you comment on the video. If you're finding the information in any of these videos helpful, if you could please give me a thumbs up, that would be wonderful. If you would like to subscribe and get future videos as they come up, because I'm going to be doing a whole series on Lightroom right here, that would be great as well. We do have a Facebook group, and there's a very specific reason I created this. If you want the information, it's in the description below. But a lot of comments I get People are asking me questions and I cannot help them because I need to see what the issue is. Facebook allows you to either post an image or a video and it makes it really easy for me to give you the answer to whatever your problem is. Well, that's the end of this video and I will see you next time.